Hey, Bourbon Lifers. This week, we had hoped to bring you an episode with Johnny Jeffrey from Bentley Heritage out in Nevada, but unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties with our recording session. So we're going to bring you Johnny's episode on October 9th. In the meantime, we're going to throw it back to one of our favorite first episodes with our good friend, Jill. Uh, this is about Bourbon Basics. Jill's a red wine drinker, so we introduced her to uh, some of our favorite easy drinking bourbons. So we hope you guys like the throwback, and we'll see you right back here next week with a brand new guest. Welcome to the Bourbon Life Podcast, your source for all things bourbon. Join your hosts, Mark and Matt, as they drink and review bourbons, share news about upcoming events, interview the who's who in the bourbon world, and most importantly, bring you along for the fun of living the bourbon life. Now, here's your hosts, Mark and Matt. All right, everybody. Well, welcome back for another episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me, as always, is Matt. Hey, how is everybody doing this evening? Matt, I'm doing great. We've had a great week here at the Bourbon Life. We've had a lot of fun. We had a lot of positive response from our second episode with Eric from Scotch and Time. So uh, we hope to follow up on that success. We've got a friend of ours in the studio with us tonight. Our friend Jill has decided to join us. Hello, Jill. Hi, how are you? Doing good. Doing good. Jill's a friend of ours here in Lexington, and Jill is a red wine drinker. I sure am. <laughs> she she loves <laughs> she loves her red wine, but Jill also has started to become a bourbon drinker. So we thought it would be a great idea to bring Jill in and share some bourbons with her, and just introduce her to some uh, basic bourbons. And we thought it might be a good idea to do that because we know we've got on our Instagram site we've got about eighty percent of our followers are men. And only 20% of our followers are women. Uh, and I think there may be some level, not intimidation, but I think women just aren't as uh, easily marketed to or are, they're not marketed to as well by the bourbon industry. And I think there's a lot of questions that a lot of people have um, that women may have about bourbon drinking. Their husbands may drink it, but but they don't. Um, I know, Matt, we talked about your girlfriend. She's not a big bourbon drinker. Yep, she's um, not a big bourbon drinker. Yeah, so, you know, this is an opportunity, I think, for us, and we've talked about this that the goal here at the bourbon life is to share our passion of love, our love of bourbon with as many people as we can, but also to educate people. And I think this is a kind of a great way for us to, uh, to do that, to bring someone in who loves red wine and, uh, who has expressed interest in drinking bourbon and learning more about bourbon and bringing her in. So Jill, we're happy you decided to join us today. Well, thank you for having me and sharing your bourbon with me tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. It is our pleasure. So, Jill, why don't you just uh, start off with telling us a little bit about yourself? You're from Kentucky, correct? And just I, I yeah, am. Let's hear I about am. it. I am. Um, I'm from Kentucky. I'm originally from um, uh, Ballard County, Kentucky. It's a town west of Paducah. That's way out west. It's way out west. <laughs> it's very close to Illinois, Missouri, Tennessee. Uh, it's a dry county. Wow. And yeah. they mm. just became wet maybe a couple years ago. Wow. One of the last holdouts. It, abs yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've lived in Lexington since 2002. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've and I still live here. And I know, do you want me to tell you, tell everyone how I know you too? <laughs> well, I was going to say, Jill and I, Jill and I met, I guess, in 2012 and continuing with our Iron Man. <laughs> That's right, listeners. If you are playing the Bourbon Life Bingo, get ready to check off the Iron Man Square. That's right. Here we go. The Iron Man Square. Jill and I met in um, 2012 when I was training for the initial Iron Man uh, event in Louisville which I did not complete, but Jill and I trained together and then we trained together again in 2013. So Jill is not just a one-time iron woman. She is a multi finisher iron, iron woman. Um, and I think has somewhat retired maybe now from the iron man <laughs> <laughs> world. How many iron man competitions have you completed? Um, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> how much money have you spent? That's the on better that? question is how much money. Yeah. <laughs> how many? And yeah. So I have completed, I feel like I've completed five, but I had two where I had um, a couple of uh, issues in the water with right. uh, swimming induced pulmonary edema that I had two back to back non finishes. So yeah. um, there were some things that I, that I addressed and then I um, came back and, and, and did that, but I've been enjoying the shorter ones yeah. uh, that don't take, you know, eight hours of biking on the weekend, but I have other challenges I've planned for this year that are also very time consuming. Great. <laughs> so. And see, you can still be active and you can still drink bourbon. So 
you know, that's what Matt and I've talked about. Being Absolutely. That, Matt's still training. Matt still drinks burp. He enjoys it, um, mm-hmm. you know, regularly, but in moderation with his training. So it is possible. Me, on the other hand, I've retired from Ironman training so I can drink as much bourbon as I want to. But speaking of bourbon, I need to thank our uh, our sponsors for this show. And this show is actually brought to you by, by the Stave Restaurant in Millville, Kentucky. Um, and actually, Rebecca, the owner, and the chef, Jonathan Sanding, is gonna, they're both going to be on our show here in a few weeks. So we're really excited about that. But again, if you're out there touring distilleries, they're really close to Castle and Key out there in Woodford Reserve. And it's a great restaurant. They've got a lot of bourbon flights and uh, you can buy your own bottles out there, take them home with you. So now back to uh, back to Jill and back to our our bourbon basics. But, um, you know, through our show, Jill, I know you're a big listener, a big fan. So uh, you, I'm your number one fan. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. Oh crap, dude! <laughs> that reminds me. Of, was Not that, that kind of. What was that crazy misery? That misery, man. I'm your number one fan, Jill. What are you doing with that sledgehammer? Why don't you put it down over there? Right? Just forget. Just drop that. Um, but we we thought it would be a, a good idea. Matt did, and uh, and I agree. Uh, Matt brought something that we think is a is really a good introductory level bourbon, and we think it's it's a great place to start if you're trying to get somebody. Interested in bourbon, uh, this will be a good one. Matt, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you got. Yeah, so what I brought is, this is Basil Hayden, and this is actually, this. so this is the Basil Hayden 10-year yeah. bourbon. This is last year. This is 2018's 10-year, uh, the first year that it was released. But Basil Hayden, to me, was the first bourbon that I had that I wasn't just drinking for the, the sole purpose of pouring gasoline down my throat to uh, to get drunk. Yeah, um, and this is this Basil Hayden holds kind of a a dear spot to my heart. I know it receives a lot of flack because it is eighty proof, so a lot lower, very entry level. But it's the the first bourbon that I can really remember enjoying the taste, enjoying drinking, and I. <laughs> I can remember being a very poor post college graduate and looking at the price. I think at the time it might have been, I don't know, twenty three or twenty five dollars, and yeah. just trying to muster up the strength to have it to buy it, and finally doing that, and taking about two years to <laughs> to open the bottle, <laughs> waiting for a special occasion. Since that is, yeah, it's a it still holds a, a spot in my heart, but now I would be. Very happy to be paying twenty five dollars for something yeah, that no held a, yeah. <clears throat> a great spot in my heart. And this is from Jim Beam, mm-hmm. so yes. it, it's a Beam product. And this is the high rye. So Basil Hayden is a high rye. Yeah, tell everybody just so people know, since we're kind of doing a bourbon mm-hmm. basics match, just tell everybody what that what that means. So that would mean bourbon, of course, has to have at least fifty one percent corn in the mash bill, uh, but other other than that, it can have other grains in it, one of which is commonly mixed in would be rye and a higher rye bourbon is typically something 25 percent or Probably, more yeah. oftentimes i know with uh something like four roses a high rye bourbon there is around 35 35 i think yeah and so i'm not entirely sure what the percentage of rye is on this bourbon, i'm not either but basil hayden is a uh, a high rye bourbon so you get yeah. a little bit more of that the rye spice uh for me that always is sometimes a little bit something um, more herbal, a little floral, and I get a lot of. Oftentimes, when I'm drinking a high rye bourbon, like a lot of peppercorn. I really love it for that. Yeah, so it's kind of it. A lot of people will see it as spicier. So, for example, have you had rye bread before, Jill? I mean, you've eaten rye bread. I've right? eaten a lot of bread. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so like if you eat a wheat bread, you know, it's right. a little, it's a little sweeter. Right. Um, it's got the wheat as the primary mm-hmm. grain, so it's going to have a sweetness to it. But if you eat a rye bread, obviously, it's got a little bit of a spicier t- you know taste to it. Um, and, and it kind of holds true in bourbon as well. So if you drink a wheated bourbon, which has wheat in the mash bill, so it's corn and wheat and malted barley, generally that bourbon's going to be a little bit sweeter um, mm-hmm. than a bourbon that has the corn and the rye, like this Basil Hayden. So the, this, it should be a little bit spicier. But um, but now, so we drink the bourbon neat right now. And that's the, I mean, for me, that's the best way to drink it. That's the way I enjoyed it. But there's no wrong way to drink bourbon. But just for purposes of smelling and tasting, uh, and for our show, we always drink it neat, um, so Jill doesn't have any ice or water or anything. It's just a, it's just a straight pour of the of the bourbon. So that's the way we're gonna we're gonna do this. But we drink it out of the Glencairns. So Jill, usually, you know, with the Glencairns, you can swirl it around a little bit, and a lot of times that'll 
that'll release some of the aroma, it gets it up into the glass. Um, and in sniffing the, the bourbon, what, what we do, what I do, kind of tilt the glass out the side a little bit, put your nose, but leave your mouth open. Because what happens is if there's alcohol vapors mm-hmm. in there, which there will be, if you leave your mouth closed, you're going to snort that up into your nose and mm-hmm. those vapors are, they're going to burn. But if you leave your mouth open, it allows the vapors to escape out of your mouth. So okay. you can smell the bourbon, not just the the alcohol that's mm-hmm. coming. So it's an easy way to smell it. Um, and then if you smell it, well, just give it a smell. And, I mean, what do you, do you smell anything, any flavors or anything? Okay. Well, first of all, are you are you swirling it like you swirl whenever you go whenever you taste wine to get it to open to get the yeah. flavor to open? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're just using different definition mm-hmm. here. Okay. Yep, yep. That's yeah. a great great point, Jill. That, that I mean, a lot of people just call it kind of airing out your bourbon. So once you pour it, sometimes you just want to let it set and swirl it just a little bit to to kind of give it that blend with the air, but. So what do you smell? I mean, as you, are you laughing over there? Like, do you want me to be honest? Do you know what I smell? It's, yeah. I mean, you, you tell please me, tell me what you smell. I mean, it's bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's, and, I've, and I've had basil Hayden, but it's been a long time, a long, long time ago. And I, you know, cause I don't drink it regu- in bourbon regularly, but I feel like it was something that it, like Matt was talking about. Maybe it's a little bit spicier. Maybe the mm-hmm. finesse is like when you drink it and I don't, but I know the key to like tasting is smelling with things. So I need to, I need to yeah. figure out what it smells like. Well, and that's but my first, my first reaction was, Oh, this smells like bourbon. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. But there, you know, there, there are flavor wheels out there. People mm-hmm. have these. And if you're not familiar with flavor wheels, basically, you know, it'll break it down. You know, each bourbon people say, well, you can usually detect some form of wood potentially in it. Mm-hmm. So you might smell oak, you might smell mm-hmm. cedar, uh, you may detect some type of fruit in mm-hmm. it. You may detect a citrus, you may detect uh, dark cherries, mm-hmm. uh, stone fruit, uh, <laughs> which is Matt's favorite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, oh, and let's see. Um, Choc- uh, dark chocolate is common, chocolate, yeah. tobacco, tobacco, leather, leather. Is, an, is another one. But. Sweets, uh, caramel, vanilla. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, you know, different bourbons are going to put out different flavors. And it's not just the bourbon itself. I mean, a lot of the flavoring comes from what well, comes from the grains in, that mm-hmm. are in the mash bill. But you're also going to, once you put it in the barrel, you know, barrels are charred on the inside. So so they have different char levels. Um, so if the heavier the char, mm-hmm. the more flavors that it can impart to the to the actual mm-hmm. liquid. And the longer that it's in the barrel, then the more flavors that the, that the bourbon is going to absorb from the barrel. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can end up with a, just a wild combination of flavors. And my, my opinion is nothing's wrong. I mean, whatever you smell, you know, and it could be, you know, Fred Minnick has written a couple of books and uh, he's got one book that's called Bourbon Curious. And it's a really good book if mm-hmm. you're just getting into bourbon, uh, especially if you're learning how to taste and develop your palate. Uh, the, the book Bourbon Curious, it's, it's a really good way to, he walks you through like, what are some of your favorite childhood memories? What are, your, what are some, of your, some of your favorite foods? Mm-hmm. Uh, things that you're familiar with on a, on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes that can spark, you know, thoughts in your mind, what that reminds you of or what it smells like to you. Mm-hmm. But there are bourbons I've had. We'd tasted one a few months ago and I was like, holy crap, this reminds me of playing baseball. And I used to chew on my leather glove when I was a kid, <laughs> which is stupid. But, but seriously, I mean, it tasted like a, mm-hmm. tasted like chewing on, you know, when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I'd have a baseball glove and get bored out in the outfield and mm-hmm. I'd chew on the straps on my baseball glove and get that leather mm-hmm. taste in this bourbon. I mean, it tasted like dead on a Wilson's. <laughs> That's what I love so much about uh, a lot of bourbons. For me, is just the memories and the sure. what you get from tasting and nosing, and what it brings up in your life. So, uh, Matt, for me, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't oh, mean to, uh, just know. for me. Uh, old trusty, old rest in peace. Heaven Hills six year bottled and bond. Oh yeah, yeah. That is. Uh, that's my grandmother's peanut butter pie. Really? Through and through. Wow. Well, you know, I've got a bottle over here on the shelves, man. We can we can break that out a little bit later, maybe after the show and sample that. Uh, so, Jill, what, what most people suggest and what we suggest is, since you've not been drinking anything, um, it's best to do what they call the Kentucky Chew when you take a drink. Mm-hmm. Your first drink is to just take a little bit in your mm-hmm. mouth and kind of swirl it around a little bit. Almost, mm-hmm. you not have to chew on it, but... You know, you want to get it in your mouth so you can, it's going to be an initial shock because mm-hmm. you don't have alcohol in your mouth. And then all of a sudden you go to an 80 proof alcohol, which is 40% alcohol. So, I mean, basically in this glass, you know, that's 40% alcohol. Mm-hmm. So we usually, and most people will suggest 
just take a little bit in your mouth, swirl it around a little mm-hmm. bit, kind of, you know, chew on it right. some. And then, and then that'll kind of get your, your palate opened up. And then your second taste is where you can usually start detecting flavors. So, but back, back to the nose, what do you, what do you pick up? Oh, the nose. Uh, I def, I get the high rye, so I get a lot of mint. That mint. Yeah. And then I get the peppercorn, the spice, the spiciness, yep. caramel, vanilla. And I get, I do get the sweetness from it. it mm-hmm. So if you smell it, Jill, yeah. I mean, do you detect a sweetness at well, all or so- do you? Yeah, we know what this reminds me of. And I was actually, I was looking at the color too. The color is very pretty. Yeah, um, it is. It's very, I like this color. Like a coppery uh, kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's really pretty, really clear. It's not too dark like some bourbons look like in the bottle. Right. Um, so I, it kind of reminds me of this thing that we used to do at Christmas where you have oranges, whole oranges, and you hammer the nutmeg, the whole nutmegs into them. Oh, yeah. It's uh-huh. like a spice. You make these spice ball decorations. I don't know what it is. But yeah. So it's like an, a dried orange rind with a nutmeg hammered into it. That, that makes sense. I mean, because you're getting a, a nutmeggy, spicy kind of yeah. flavor and a little mm-hmm. bit of citrus. I mean, that's... We used to do that growing up with cloves as well. Oh, it's cloves. Them. It's cloves, not nutmeg. Yeah. In, it's cloves. Nutmeg yeah. in there would yeah. be... Well, Never well, mind, not that'd nutmeg. Be a big nut. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I knew what she meant too. Oh, but another thinking, thing about me, I don't cook a lot, so yeah, it's one of those spices. <laughs> Jill, Jill likes to drink a lot of red wine, and you know that's not just kidding. <laughs> but that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to take my drink here. I have not tasted it. Okay. That's interesting. You say that about the oranges now. Jill, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm you're starting to pick that. it up. Yeah, before I've never tasted that before on this bourbon, and this is one that uh, I was initially. I don't want to say underwhelmed, but uh, for a ten-year product, granted it is eighty proof. When I first opened it, I don't, I don't know if I was quite as taken back. But I set it down on the shelf and let it sit for maybe eight, nine, ten months, and just forgot about it. And then got back into it just a couple months ago, and I was surprised, I was yes. pleasantly surprised by it. Yeah, and I that, think uh, for ten years old and eighty proof, this might be about as good as it can can get in that yeah with those constraints up on it all right jill so you've had a taste okay so yeah and what, i'm yeah I, I kind of feel like it's a dried orange rind too that a dry it, it's kind of like a dried orange rind like i said it tastes like that but i'm picking up some other things too yeah so i need to take another drink of it yes you do yeah. definitely yeah that's funny because now everybody's got oranges on my mind you know it's like <laughs> damn it yeah. Now it's like I'm picking up that citrus note. Mind control. The, it is. <laughs> the, it's group think. But, yeah. you know, I mean, it's funny because third episode in a row that I'm going to talk about the fact that I love high proof bourbons, but I don't drink 80 proofers. Um, but this actually drinks a little bit hotter to me than. Yeah, it's than that, I, the finish. Yeah, that, it is. That high rye <laughs> yeah. on the finish. It's got a, a really nice finish yeah. to it. It yeah. leaves you with a little bit, but it, there's. No burn. No. But there, great I, taste. Yeah, I don't get a burn off of this. My tongue gets a tiny bit of a little tingle off of it. Yep. Uh, but then it kind of subsides. So it's a you know not a not a long finish, but it's a, and that's after you, the the palate is really what you pick up, mm-hmm. you know, once it hits and some people talk about the front palate like the front of your tongue versus the back mm-hmm. the back palate. And then as you know, once you swallow, the finish is kind of that leftover mm-hmm. lingering and and the flavors can change as it's in your mouth. Mm-hmm. Um Matt, what are you getting on the finish? Are you still p- picking spiciness up on this yeah, one? Yeah, I still get the spiciness. A little, that vanilla comes through. Yeah. It's it's smooth. Just It's a good high ride bourbon, a little bit of spice, a little bit of the minty. What about you, Jill? I, I, I'm picking up more on the spice, spiciness on the second sip, I guess you could say. Uh-huh. But it's on it's finishing on the roof of my mouth more than uh-huh. my tongue this time. And also like on my lips as it finishes and it just kind of sits there. Like I can kind of taste it. Yeah. Like as the taste dies down, it kind of spreads out to like my lips, the top of my the roof of my mouth and further on my tongue. It's kind of yeah. interesting. Kind of like wine, you know. Yeah. So you can you compare it? So as a, I mean, since it's neat, obviously, I mean, is it a burn? Are you feeling a burn? Does it? No, it's smooth. I mean, I think it's smooth. I think at first it's kind of like, you know, it, it, right. but it's no, it's, it's not a, it's not a burn. It's definitely, you know, like maybe whatever you were drinking before you bought this, you know, you're like we drink in <laughs> high school, Man, the, uh, the, 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 the gasoline. Uh, this but, could be uh, dangerous though. But no, but this is, yeah, this is good. And this is, um, mm-hmm. like I said, I haven't had it in a while, but I like the way that it, I like the way that it, um, it finishes, but, um. Yeah, it's for me. It's strong. It's kind of strong. <laughs> well, sure it is. I mean, because you're not a regular bourbon drinker, but it is a good introductory bourbon. Uh, it is 80 proof, and that's the lowest proof that you're going to be able to get mm-hmm. on a bourbon. And this is aged for 10 years, so it does have a little bit more complexity. I mean, a lot of your uh, 
a lot of bourbons that are lower proof mm -hmm. are going to be probably younger. Um, but that 10 years gives it a, a lot more depth and gives it more complexity. So you pick up a lot of different flavors than you would from like a two year old or a four year old bourbon. So yeah. in the, the last sip, I just took a third sip of this sample. So it was totally different. I got more of the vanilla at that time. It was smoother. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as burny. Yeah. So it's, that's very interesting too. There you and go. then what, so a question about this. So when does, when, when does this peak? Well, you know, when, when does this, when does this peak? When is it, is it, so it's good after 10 years, but at, is it going to be better after 20 years? Is it better at 12 years? Is it better at eight years? Did, Matt, what do you, that's a good question. That is a very good question. Um, I think, and without being a master distiller or someone from Jim Beam who's putting out this product in this case, it, it's hard to answer, I suppose. At 10 years, I think this is a, a really great bourbon at 80 proof. I think at 10 years, if it were to come out at cast strength, so without being watered down or straight out of the barrel, who knows what it would taste. I think it would be absolutely phenomenal um, at 12 or 15 years. You have to wonder at that point, you're aging a bourbon quite a long time to then put a fair amount of water in it to bring it down to 80 proof. So I'm, I'm just... <laughs> Thinking from a like a strictly monetary standpoint here, I don't know if there would be much reason to take a bourbon to fifteen, right. eighteen prove years, and then proof it down to eighty. Uh, not that you couldn't, and not that it wouldn't be a great product, but uh, it seems like today a lot of the trends within the bourbon industry are going towards longer age, higher proof. Uh, yeah. But maybe this maybe this could be a call to some companies to experiment with taking some of your older product and bringing it down to a lower proof and seeing what happens then. Yeah. At a lower proof, a, a bourbon doesn't have as much to hide behind where with a high proof bourbon, it's all bourbon. It's all taste. It's all flavor. When you bring something down to 90 proof, 80 proof, you're adding so much water in there that flavor is diluted so you really have to have a product that's going to stand out with that low of a proof so it's it's a reasonable challenge yeah. i think for a distillery to produce a product especially a consistent product that's going to come out at such a low proof yeah and this is a this is a 10 year old so normal basil hayden is what eight eight years old or is it even younger than i that? think it's younger than Six. i know they released an eight year old okay that was age stated but i I it's want to say probably it's younger, younger than, than that. Younger than most that. Of it, so, yeah. so what they've done is, you know, they they've got their basil Hayden, and they they obviously thought, well, this would be better if we aged it longer, or let's just see what happens. So somebody at Jim Beam made the decision: we're going to go for a ten year, um, and then this it's a batch. I mean, it's not a single barrel. So a single barrel bourbon is where they're just taking a barrel and bottling it off of that one barrel. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get multiple bottles. You know, depending on the age, anywhere from maybe 180 to 210 bottles out of one barrel. So a single barrel bourbon is straight, you know, it's out of that one barrel. It's not batched. It may be, they may add water to prove it down, but it's going to be out of one barrel. But this, it basically is a combination. It's a blend, like a blended whiskey or a blended wine. Um, it's the, all the same bourbon, but it's all these different barrels. So they may take 50 barrels and blend all that together. And then they bottle off of that blended, uh, 50 barrels. Um, so it'll be a combination of all those flavors from all those different barrels. But that's a good point. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is obviously someone at Jim Beam said, you know, 10 years is what we want to do with this particular brand. And that's what we're going to do. So, but you know, you've got bourbons that are 12 year old, 10 year old, 15 year old, 18 year old, 20 year old, 23 year old. I mean, there's a 25 year old, um, Pappy that's mm -hmm. very elusive. There's Heaven Hill, <laughs> Heaven Hill just put out a, 27 year old old Carter has a 27 old Carter has a 27 year old whiskey. Yeah. So there are, mm -hmm. there are brands that are putting out, you know, old, old, old. And you know, a lot of people say that the, that too many years in the barrel, it's going to get a lot of Oak, like you're chewing on a piece of wood, you know? <laughs> so I, I've not had the old Carter 27. I know a lot of people that really like it. Um, I've never had the 23 Pappy either. I guess the oldest I've had is probably 18, the Elijah Craig 18, we had our first episode, mm -hmm. which is really good. But, um, yeah, so the master distillers, you know, they're making the decision, how long do we want to age this? And, and, you know, is it going to meet our flavor profile? So, but that's a good point. So, well, we're going to take a quick break since we've made it through our first, our first pour 
and uh, we're going to come back in just a couple minutes and we're going to move on and try something just a little bit different. So hang out with us and uh, we'll be back in just a few. Hey, bourbon lifers, when you're out hunting for those hard to find bottles or just enjoying the distilleries of central Kentucky, you're going to work up an appetite. And when it's time to refuel, we suggest that you visit our good friends, Rebecca and Eric Burnworth at the Stave Restaurant. Located at 5711 McCracken Pike in Millville, Kentucky, close to Castle and Key and Woodford Reserve, the Stave Restaurant is just off the beaten path, nestled on the banks of Glens Creek. Chef Jonathan Sanning prepares amazing food each day featuring an elevated Kentucky-inspired cuisine. You can take our word for it, the food alone is worth the trip to the Stave. With a full-service bar, great bourbon flights, and signature cocktails, the Stave is the perfect place to catch up with friends after a fun-filled day of touring the local distilleries. And you can even purchase bottles of bourbon to take home with you while you're there. Make sure to follow The Stave on Instagram and Facebook at The Stave Kentucky or visit them online at thestavekentucky.com to stay up to date on everything that's going on. The Stave Restaurant is a bourbon lover's paradise right here in the heart of bourbon country. All right. Well, we are back for round two here at The Bourbon Life. Thanks again for joining us. We appreciate all your support. We appreciate you hanging out with us uh, wherever you may be listening to this. And with us is our friend Jill in the studio. And Jill, again, is a red wine drinker. I am. <laughs> Although tonight that's, it's a white. That's yeah. right. It's she is, a white yeah, she does have tonight. a white wine with her. But uh, yeah. Jill has expressed interest in uh, in learning more about bourbon. And so, again, this episode is really dedicated to just some bourbon basics and a good way to just introduce people in your life that, that may be interested in bourbon or that you want to get interested in uh, drinking bourbon with you. Um but, you know, my position on this is that, you know, again, our Instagram account, we've got, we've got over 32,000 followers and 80% of those are men. Um, and only 20% are women. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily a reflection of the Instagram account as much as it may just be an, a reflection of what the bourbon industry is right now. I mean, it's, it's a growing market. It's expanding the opportunities for women is, uh, they're, they're really growing at this point. There are a lot of women involved in the bourbon industry, but I think historically, historically, I think that the whiskey and bourbon industry has been targeted to, more towards men. Um, I think when you see a group of guys on television or whatever celebrating, they're drinking whiskey or, or whatever. But when you see a group of women celebrating on TV, they're drinking Manhattans or Cosmopolitans. I mean, they're not sitting around drinking neat whiskey. So I think there's just some, I don't know, to me, it just seems like there's some, maybe some, some issues there. Um, so, you know, we, we want to make it accessible to everybody. Uh, we love bourbon and we want everybody to, to understand and appreciate bourbon as much as, as we do. So that's our goal here is just kind of laying down some bourbon basics and introducing one of our good friends to, to some introductory types of bourbon that she can, she can enjoy and, uh, become a fellow bourbon aficionado. <laughs> I, I, I think there, I think there's a lot of women, especially in this area who are very knowledgeable about bourbon sure. and it always impresses me, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a female and I know when I'm being marketed to. And when you see, you know, mommy juice shirts and drinkers and yeah. glasses and aprons and rosé all day kind of things, you know, that's not really for you guys. It's really being marketed to, you know, right. um, uh, to, to me, and you know that, that that kind of thing, um, and I, 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 you know, not as much not as much bourbon isn't, but bourbon is for everyone. It is, right? I'm, so I'm just curious, kind of on along those same lines. What is there anything? I mean, do you feel like the bourbon industry targets women as their target market at all, or do you feel like like bourbon the distillers are really after you as a as a customer? I, I feel like um, just because I've I live here and I live near a lot of sure. distilleries that they don't, you know, they don't really treat, they, they want to sell to everyone. They don't treat me any differently. I think traditionally it's more, you know, marketed, maybe not even marketed to men, but that's kind of what you see. Sure. That's kind of like the stereotype. But anytime that I've been to any event, um, you know, no one has tried to mansplain bourbon to me. <laughs> I guess. You know, they. I, th I think when you live in Lexington, Kentucky, they think you know a little bit about it. Yeah, true. And yeah. I do. I know very little, but um, most people know mm. a little bit about it here. And um, it's. I think it's a. I think the the bourbon community here as a whole is really welcoming, and and they're very cool. And I don't think that they're as snobbish as some of the wine community might be in some places. Sure. I, I do think they're more. 
um, even if it's a very, um, you know, like the elusive Pappy, like you said, you know, right. you never know who's going to end up with Pappy, right? It could be, you that's know, right. it could be yeah. your, your uncle Jed. It could be yeah, that's right. <laughs> anybody. Mm-hmm. You just don't know. So I, I think, I think it's a pretty, you know, I think it's a pretty open world and I think we're also seeing some more diversity in it. Like sure. you said, we have some female, oh, yeah. you know, um, executives, female uh, master distillers. Master, I mean, there's mm-hmm. yeah a lot of, a mm-hmm. lot of women really making, mm-hmm. making inroads in the, in the bourbon community and doing a lot of great things. And Matt and I were just talking, there's a lady, Peggy, no Stevens, who's uh, huge in the bourbon industry. Uh, she was actually one of the original creators of the bourbon trail. Uh, mm-hmm. she's worked in, she created the bourbon women group, which is the first, uh, nationwide group of women, uh, who are bourbon drinkers. And that may be a good, you know, group for a lot of women to get involved with is mm-hmm. bourbon women. She also works with bourbon plus magazine, but Peggy was just inducted last year into the Kentucky distillers association, into their hall of fame. And just recently was named to the whiskey magazine hall of fame. I think just this weekend or yesterday. So, um, I mean, there's a, a Marianne, uh, I'm draw- oh man, I've drawn a blank on her last name now from that was with Castle and Key was the master distiller. Uh, she, she, you know, she's done great things with them. The Netheries at Jephthah Cree distillery, uh, doing some great things. And then, the, you know, the Michter's crew, um, and I'm drawing blanks on names, unfortunately on this, but you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of women that are doing some great things in the, in the bourbon industry. And I, and I hope, and I think that will, what we'll probably see is that, that as more and more women get involved and get higher up in involved in the corporate uh, arena and also in the, the distilling standpoint that we'll see that that'll kind of trickle down to the consumers as well. And I think hopefully we'll see more women, you know, more advertising, marketing, uh, more products geared towards women to bring them into the, into the community because, you know, we're, we're an open community. Uh, we don't want to just be like a, like a good old boy network. And I think there could be some perceptions that bourbon is just a bunch of good old boys, you know, having fun and, and women aren't allowed, but that's nothing could be further from the truth, you know, for us. Cause quite frankly, I would love to go to any <laughs> bourbon release and not be surrounded by a bunch of dudes. It'd be great to have more beautiful looking women out there. We, in the we, bourbon community. You know, and we do. I mean, when we go to these bourbon releases sometimes overnight, there are, there are women out there that are camping out just like, just like we are. The first one I went to, as a matter of fact, this uh, young girl was out um, all night long and the guys, we were all just going and jumping. It was in the winter. And we would all go jump in our cars for like 30 minutes, you know, turn on the heater and warm up and then come back and sit in our chair for another hour and then go back to our car. And this girl, she set out, she had a sleeping bag. She got zipped up in mm-hmm. it. She had on overalls, she had on boots. She was in her sleeping bag, put a blanket over her head and she sat out there all night long. So I was like, man, that's tough. I mean, it's tougher than I was. So, well, I love not camping. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably not going to do that. But, All right. So no, camp, no yeah. bourbon camp outs for Jill. I think, okay. I, I think that's really cool. But I, I will add too that I've, I've seen that there's more of an African American presence too. Uh-huh. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that that's, that's really cool. And um, that really shows that it's kind of for everybody. Yeah. Um, but there are also some, um, you know, some events that kind of bring it all together for everyone. I, we were talking earlier um, today about the the bourbon chase which is difficult almost impossible to get into um right. and it's basically a 200 mile relay race in october and you go to multiple distilleries and there are people from all over the united states and some other countries as well that participate in this and i, I did it a couple of years ago i've been a runner and whatever forever and i've never done this so i got on a team and it was just really cool and they yeah. oh, they give you drinks <laughs> here go go run your eight mile leg here's some bourbon yeah, yeah. just so everybody knows that what the bourbon chase is <laughs> it's a it, it is a 200 mile relay race and um, most people will put together teams of six maybe four six eight ten people mm-hmm. and everybody on the team gets to run or runs so many miles and you do it overnight it's it's what 24 to 36 hours mm-hmm. or something like that however long it takes your your team to finish 200 miles of running and they run through the night out on these back country road which is <laughs> Just freaks me out that there are people out there in the middle of the night running on some. If you guys have been to some of these distilleries in central Kentucky, you know how, <laughs> how bad some of these roads are. Now, it's insane. There are people out there run, <laughs> running, but they do it. Have you, you've not done the bourbon chase, have you? I've not done the bourbon chase, but I have been to a couple of distilleries for <laughs> Camping out, waiting for a few <laughs> bottles. <laughs> kind of wondered where I took a wrong turn to end up. Yeah, man, down I, where I was, but I can't imagine. But yeah, so it's a it's a really cool event. Um, 
and Jill's obviously obviously done it. So that's something that a lot of people probably don't even know about. And it exposes uh, people to it, and yeah. they get to see the different distilleries. And I, I tell you, there's one of the most beautiful sunrises of my life was we were waiting for our runner to get it in Heaven Hill. Oh, yeah. And it was misty, and the sun was coming up. I mean, it was we were just like, this is beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, and so that was just really, really a cool thing to – um, to experience. And some of these places are just, they're just gorgeous. They really sure. are. And there's beautiful artwork. Um, there, it, every, everyone is just really, really yeah. unique. So the bourbon trail, it's not, it's not just about the bourbon. I mean, it's about the, it's about the communities. It's about mm-hmm. the people. It's about, it's about everything. I and mean, there's a lot of beauty that that's here in central Kentucky and throughout Kentucky, but, uh, on the bourbon trail, there's just a lot of things to be involved with and the, and to see. So it's a, it's cool that, that, uh, that we have that we're very fortunate to be here in Kentucky and sometimes take that for granted. So, mm-hmm. all right, Matt. On well, the, speaking of heaven, Hill, yeah, here, speaking Mark, of heaven, Hill, what a <laughs> perfect what are, segue. What are we yeah. about to drink here? What well, do we have? I believe Matt has brought us yet another, this is the Elijah Craig small batch. Um, but this is an actual store pick. So this is a single barrel. Yep. This is, I'll take over from here. This is a bottle. I <laughs> oh, okay. <brought>. Thanks, Matt. Go ahead. <laughs> take right over. Uh, this is, um, this is from Tippins Market in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And if you've never been to Tippins Market, if you happen to be in the Ann Arbor, Michigan or the greater Detroit area, you need to stop into Tippins Market. They do some of the best, if not the best barrel picks I've ever had. Some of their four roses are legendary barrel picks. And this Elijah Craig was certainly not one to be missed. It comes in at 94 proof and this was barreled in 2008. So this is probably a, a at 10, least 10, 11, yeah. maybe yeah, 11 year old, old bourbon. Um, and this is another kind of like the first one, the, the 10 year Basil Hayden is a little harder to come by. This Elijah Craig is something that any bourbon drinker can find on the shelf at any store. Yeah. And oftentimes you can find a single barrel pick like we did here with this Tippins Market pick. So thank you, Tippins Market. And this is another really great introductory level bourbon yeah and it and you know it's it's only what around 24 maybe 25 yeah something like that for a not necessarily for a single barrel store pick but for the baseline the regular elijah craig small batch you're talking 24 25 dollars uh and you can find it anywhere so uh it's a it's an easy pour it's an now jill this is 94 proof so it is 14 proof points higher <laughs> <laughs> it's 14 so it's seven percent higher in alcohol uh so it is going to, you know, it, it may be a little bit hotter is what we, you know, we'd say hotter, uh, but you may detect a little bit more of the alcohol in there. So now this mash bill though, Matt, this is actually, um, what was it? 70 something or 80? Seven, it's a 12% rye, I believe. 12% rye. So the basil Hayden was a higher rye. So there's a more spiciness to it. So this still has the rye. So it's corn and rye. And 78% say, corn, 10% rye, 12 barley. Okay. So you've got, mm-hmm. you've got just a lower, a much lower amount of rye in it. So it's not going to necessarily have as much spiciness to it. Uh, you know, Matt talked about the mintiness mm-hmm. of the other one and the floral notes. You may not pick that up, um, but with a higher corn percentage, 78%, uh, you know, corn's sweet. So that's going to reflect in your bourbon as well. So when you get these higher corn mash bills, a lot of times you're going to pick up a lot of sweetness, mm-hmm. but that, that rye should give it just a little bit of spice to it as well. So mm-hmm. Matt, what are you picking up on the nose on this one? Hmm. Or Jill, what you got anything? I are get you? the corn. I kind of get creamed corn, like the, the sweeter sweet corn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was going to say that it, bourbon that that it's that it <laughs> smells like leather and corn, but I didn't know that's, if I could say corn because it's made of corn. <laughs> no, I mean you can. That's why you know we you pick up that corn sweetness, yeah. and Matt picks up he. He picks up the uh, cream corn. Yeah. I kind of get like cornbread too. Yeah, but I pick mm-hmm. up leather. I mean, I can I can mm-hmm. detect the I leather, leather, yeah, the leather in there as well. So I mean, yeah, definitely getting that on the nose. A little honey, a little bit. Kind of to go with the cornbread. Mm, cornbread and honey sounds like a good southern meal. <laughs> okay, maybe not. <clears throat> but that's good. Have you mm-hmm. tasted it yet, Jill? Or no, <laughs> I will. <laughs> You're afraid because it's higher proof. Yeah. I get it. Okay. That's all right. That's all right. I like the color on this one too. Mm-hmm. Um, a little different than the than the Basil Hayden, but um, still kind of coppery colored. So it's a 
definitely got a nice color to it. And that's really good, and it's not as spicy. It's not as spicy. Right. That's right. Yeah. So it's a, it's the lower rye content. Mm-hmm. So in the Mashville, so Very you're not smooth. Yeah, it mm-hmm. is smooth for a higher proof. Now that 80 proof, I did think that drink a little bit higher or hotter to me. Yeah, I think the rye, the that, high, the high yeah. rye recipe. Mm-hmm. In it. But I don't think this is any Mm-mm. at 94 proof. I really don't think this drinks any hotter to me than what that that 80 proof basil hayden which is kind of weird yeah but, but i don't i'm not getting a lot of heat off of that i still get to, i get a light finish there's not it doesn't have a very long finish to this one Mm-mm. i don't get that tingle tongue thing and that could be more from the rye from the basil hayden are you picking up anything on the palate jill mm-hmm. it's a Like almost like a cinnamon stick, like a, like a, you know, like a dry cinnamon, uh, yep, you know? Uh, yep. I get cinnamon. I get, I get that a lot of times mm-hmm. on a bourbon. I'll get a, but, I get a cinnamony but flavor like, to it. Not hot, <laughs> but not like hot, sure. cloying yeah. cinnamon, but you know. Like those little, like a, like a red cinnamon. Like a cinnamon thing. disc. Like yeah. A, I feel like the dry like cinnamon, thing. the actual like cinnamon that you can get in a bundle, the dry oh, yeah. cinnamon. Yeah. yeah like that's that. That's. Yeah, yeah it, definitely. And, uh, and, uh, and like I said, I mean, I get a. On the finish, I do get a, I mean, a little bit on the top of my, the roof of my mouth in the front and just a little bit on my tongue. There's a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, uh, I just say it's a tingle, but, um, it's not a very long, not a very, I mean, it doesn't like coat my entire mouth, you know, so it's a smooth finish. It's an easy drinker again, like the Basil Hayden, Mm -hmm. but again, at 94 proof, it's a, it's a good introductory bourbon. But speaking of introductory bourbons, what would you say, Jill? Was your first, uh, <laughs> this sounds like a good story coming up. So what's your first experience that you remember with, with bourbon? That I remember? That you remember. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, it would be preferable that you actually remember the uh, the event. But if you don't, you can tell um, us what, what you've heard third hand from other people about, <laughs> about what you did. Well, I will just say that um, even though I grew up in a dry county, maybe I was very young and maybe I knew where to buy some things. <laughs> so... Um, it was, I guess, is it Jim Beam or, yeah, so. Yep, Jim Beam. Jim Beam, which is whiskey. But bourbon, it is bourbon whiskey. Right, right. So, yeah, that's, yeah, I used to like hard liquor when I was in high school. I wasn't really much of a, I didn't really start off with Budweiser. I just went straight for the, we, we drank a, yeah. Look, there you go. So Yeah, there we went. So you weren't a, uh, you weren't at Boone's Farm or a, well, a now, Mad Dog 2020 or a, Bartles, uh, Bartles and James wine coolers or well, did, you did you know, have some, yeah, I've, yes, I've had all those, but, um, the funny, <laughs> but, but, um, my mom was a Bartles and James wine cooler person. So that meant my sister and I snuck that and gotcha. watered uh, it down, watered, so your sister watered it down. Yeah. Grew yeah. up on. <laughs> Bartles, well, thank you yeah. for your support. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yeah. for your support. Yeah. So my mother just, she wasn't much of a drinker. She would get a four pack of Bartles and James and it would take her about four or five months to drink oh, yeah, it and okay. my sister and I could not stand for that so we <laughs> took matters into our own hands <laughs> and then you'd fill it back up with something water like, right? or water, yeah, lemonade yeah. whatever and so um, are, how many parents out there their liquor cabinets ended up in that same situation I mean that's I just know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I can think of someone in the, this room maybe <laughs> Matt I think, yeah maybe my parents have a bottle of vodka in their liquor cabinet still that <laughs> Might be ninety percent water. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, that's yeah. a good thing about vodka, though. Unless you taste it, nobody, uh, nobody's going to really know just from the look of it. Right. But unfor- unfortunately, with whiskey, yeah, welcome with, well, to uh, yeah, that's why high schoolers went to it. Yeah, no, yeah, no doubt, no kidding. Yeah, that's we funny. we would drink like, a, and this is an abomination, right? Jack and Coke. Oh man. <laughs> well, okay. The abomination is not the fact that you mixed your whiskey with with anything, because in my opinion, there's no wrong way to drink. To drink your your whiskey, if you like to put ice in it, that's fine. If you want to put water or Sprite or L eight one or mm-hmm. Coke or whatever, the abomination to me is that you were drinking Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's you know, I mean, we just that's what we did that and sure, yeah. So we that's that's kind of what we would drink. And like I said, I wasn't much of a beer person until I went to college and was maybe forced to drink some Strawberry Hill and some Keystone and some little, do you know what little Mickey's are? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mickey's Big like, Mouth. The little yeah. Big Mouth bottles. Or? The hand grenades. Yeah. yeah the hand grenades. Yeah. yeah. Mickey's Big Mouth. Yeah. I only yeah. thought they sold Mickey's in forties. Oh no, no. You can oh, buy no. Mickey's little man. Oh, man. My best no. friend. Well, you that's can, a whole you can buy a 40 pack of them. You could buy a 40 pack of them. They came in like a Kool-Aid crate almost, you know, those little generic <laughs> Kool-Aid. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
We or all just it. bought it by the forty ounce. Mickey, it's so. malt liquor, right? Yeah, yeah. Mickey's yeah. malt liquor. Yeah. yeah, they had the they had the wide mouth or the big mouth little hand grenade mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. green glass bottles, mm-hmm. man. So, oh mm-hmm. yeah, my best friend. That was the first time he ever got drunk. Was drinking. He drank like six or seven of those, and boom, he was gone. Yeah. So. That's a, another story for another day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I did, I, I did have my, you know, time that I did drink some. Even, you know, when I started drinking wine, there was some questionable choices that I made. But I had to grow up one day, and that, yeah, didn't want to do that anymore. So, yeah. yeah so now, I didn't. Jill, and I don't think we talked about this, but you had asked us when we took the break, uh, talking about storing bourbon. So, yeah, I had a, I have a question about storing bourbon because I had a bad wine incident over Thanksgiving. My sister, my sister used to live outside of San Francisco and I guess in like 2001 we were on a wine tour there with some people I have several stories about that but um, <laughs> one was I, I bought some wine and I had a 1997 San Giovese left from this this place called Turnbull Vineyard and not a lot of people know about it it's pretty great though yeah and it was just one of those bottles that you get and it's like I'm gonna save it and I didn't store it correctly because when I got it I didn't know how to store it and so I kept trying to get this bottle out whenever my sister loves red wine too. So I always either forgot to bring it to her. She does, you know, she lives outside of Atlanta and she's always lived somewhere else. And then when she comes in, I've always forgotten, you know, and I've moved this bottle around quite a bit. So this Thanksgiving she was in and I'm like, we're going to open this bottle. So we did, the cork was dry and it was vinegar and it was a tragedy. (laughs) <laughs> and we it ruined thanksgiving no i'm kidding it didn't yeah. no we just uh, no we had a lot of other bottles we just opened another one but we were like <laughs> we, uh, yeah, yeah we have a lot of we're, no. we're, we have a lot of bottles get something so. else yeah. yeah yes but it was it's it's you know so if, was it was it, was it was it an expensive bottle or was it just a bottle that you really liked and wanted to i will just say at the time when i bought it it was very expensive for me i got you sure. um mm-hmm. but it's it but yeah i mean it is it was worth yeah it was worth you know a lot more you know today or whatever but it's worth nothing now so sure. we couldn't drink it but it was a nice bottle of wine you know yeah. and you also you know just like bourbon you don't have to spend you know you, you know you can get a good bottle of wine for you know under twenty dollars if you know sure. what you're looking for you know you can get a good bottle of wine for twelve or thirteen dollars really yeah um you, can, you, can you can't get, get a good bottle of bourbon for thirteen dollars. Well, well you, you can find some yeah bo- some bottom yeah. shelfers that are actually you know yeah. for an everyday drinker you can actually you can actually do yeah. that. So it's not uncommon. Um, but even that Elijah Craig twenty twenty three. I mean, the thing about wine is you, you open a bottle of wine, you get three and a half glasses or four at the most out of it. Mm-hmm. You open a bottle of bourbon, I mean, you're going to be able to get twenty five ounce you know one mm-hmm. ounce pours out of it. So yeah, if you spend twenty five bucks. You know, you can you can drink on that for a while, mm-hmm. uh, and you're gonna get your you're gonna get your money's worth. But the good news about bourbon, as opposed to wine, Matt, let her know. The good thing on this topic about bourbon is, so long as it's stored responsibly, your shelf life is fairly unlimited. So we're talking good. keep it out of the sunlight. Don't put it in your sauna and store it in there. <laughs> Just don't store it in your bathroom. Uh, just be responsible with it and so, you should be able to be drinking your bourbon as long as you need to. And Jill, I will tell you that there, you know, here we go back to the very extra old Fitzgerald, but, uh, not the best <laughs> for you bingo players at home, there's <laughs> this another is one. Box, box number two to check off, but the best bourbon I ever had was a 10 year old bourbon that was actually barreled in 1956 and bottled in 1966. And I just had it this past summer. Um, okay. now I don't know how long the bottle has been open, but obviously it was bottled in 1966 so obviously a very 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 long time ago uh the bourbon was was perfect and and you know the dusties people call them dusties these old bottles um it's a huge thing in the bourbon marketplace now that people seek out these old bottles to find and and to drink um and there are some places where even like old overholt rye uh, there's archtown bourbon has a bottle of it and it's from 1909 or 1907 um, and it was actually bottled in 1907, uh, and it I've never I unfortunately haven't tasted it, but people absolutely love it. You know, mm-hmm. so you store it properly, you you take care of it, then you're going to be able to enjoy. it. I'm not going to recommend that you keep a bottle for a 113 years, <laughs> um, but you know you can keep a bottle for several years as long as uh, Matt says it's stored uh, responsibly. Yeah, and we're talking mm-hmm. in the like the north south orientation, correct? Not laid right, over, not on laid its over side. side, right? You don't want to store it like a like a bottle of wine, people, yeah. you know, you want to leave it, you want to leave it vertical. Um, 
so you're not going to damage the cork because the alcohol, the high alcohol content in bourbon will destroy your, your cork. And uh, unfortunately, people will go and try to cork it and the cork's destroyed. Um, and then you can, you know, let air, if the cork gets destroyed, it's going to let more air in, which can, you know, eventually take away the flavor of your bourbon. But yeah, as long as you store it properly, you can keep a bottle for a, for a long time. So that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, well, I had a bad experience, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Hey, you know what? You, That's okay. These, these you life learned. lessons, right, that you yeah. learned. So, all right. Well, we have finished our second round. Jill, what do you think about that, Elijah Craig? Oh, it's really good. You like that yeah, one? Yeah, I like it. It's so different. between the two, which one do you think you like better, the Basil Hayden or, or the Elijah Craig? I, th- I mean, I think they both have their their good qualities, right? That's They're it. both very different. I mean, it's just like, do you want to drink a red or a white wine? I think it sure. depends on what you like and what you're eating. And, and I'm mostly... You know, mostly a red wine drinker. In the summer, I'll have some white, and right. I stole this from your upstairs, so I'm a white wine drinker tonight. <laughs> well, that's a that's a good politically correct answer. That's a that's a very very good uh, good way to answer. And we're going to take just another quick break here for just a minute, and uh, we'll be right back with our final segment with our friend Jill. So just sit tight, folks, and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, this is Mark with the Bourbon Life Podcast, and I know this is usually the point in the show where we hear a word or two about our sponsors, but for this episode, Matt and I just wanted to take a moment and talk to you all. We're all dealing with uncertain times right now, and we want to do all we can to continue to share our love of bourbon with you every week. We truly appreciate all of your support, and we love the great feedback we've received. We know that right now, there are a lot of people out there who are temporarily displaced from their jobs. You may know a lot of them. You may even be one of them. For those of you who are temporarily out of work, We just want to say that we support you, and we want to encourage you to hang in there. We will get through this. And for those of you out there who are fortunate enough to still be working, we just want to encourage you to do what you can to help everybody else out. Order takeout, get delivery, and tip those people who are still working the best they can. They need our help more than ever right now, and we can make a difference for them. That's what really makes this community so amazing. We care about each other, and we look out for one another. And for any of you out there who work in the medical field, or service first responders, or just doing your job every day to keep America running right now. We just want to say thank you for your service and dedication, and we really appreciate you. So from Matt and myself, may your glasses always be full, and we hope you keep on living the bourbon life. All right, everybody, welcome back to the final segment of this week's episode of the Bourbon Life podcast. And again, uh, we've had, we got Jill in the studio with us, our friend. She is a red wine drinker, and we're trying to convert her... <laughs> into being a bourbon <laughs> drinker. Um, nah, but Jill's expressed interest and she's hung out with us several times and uh, she's had some mixed bourbon drinks that I've made, um, an old fa- a smoked old fashioned being one of her favorites. Very good. Or at least she says it is. Maybe she's just, you know, being nice to me. But um, but yeah, so we're just trying to introduce her into drinking just bourbon, you know, by itself neat or on the rocks or, or you know, maybe with a little bit of water. But tonight we're drinking everything neat. So we got our third and final pour that we're going to have. And this one I chose and I went with the Weller Special Reserve. And it's it's from Buffalo Trace in Frankfurt. So it's close by to us. Um, it's become harder to find. But if you know, if you know what you're doing, you can find Special Reserve pretty easily. Um, it's a 90 proof wheated bourbon. So what that means, we talked earlier you know, every bourbon has to have at least 40, 51% corn, and then they have a flavoring grain. And the, the two we drank already, the um, one was a higher rye, so it had rye in the mash bill, and then the Elijah Craig was a little bit lower, but they were both rye-based. This is a, what they call a wheater or wheated bourbon, so it's got corn, and I don't know what the exact, I don't think anybody really knows what the exact mash bill is on, mm-hmm. on Buffalo Trace products, but it's got, it's got corn, so it's got the sweetness from the corn, but this has wheat instead of rye. So there is no rye in this mash bill. It's it's corn, wheat, and uh, malted barley. So most wheaters are going to generally be a little bit sweeter. Uh, we talked earlier, you know, when you eat wheat bread, uh, wheat bread is going to be a little bit sweeter than a, than a rye bread, which is more spicy. And the same kind of holds true with your bourbon. If you got a if you got a bourbon that's got a wheated mash bill, you're generally going to have a little bit of a sweeter uh, bourbon. So this is 90 proof. It's a, it's a pretty easy drinker. So it's four it's four proof lower than the Elijah Craig that we just had in the second segment. So, um, Matt, anything you want to add about the special reserve? This is the first one we've had tonight that doesn't have an age 
stated or we can't find the age on. There you go. Um, but the bottle does not have an age statement, so that tells us it's at least four years. Yeah. Because anything under four years to be straight Kentucky bourbon has to have an age, age statement, statement. Yeah. right on the label. So uh, I think we know, or people in the in the bourbon industry and, and bourbon enthusiasts know that Weller Special Reserve is typically like a maybe five to seven yeah, somewhere year in product, and uh, then the antique, the one hundred and seven, usually like what six to eight, maybe yeah. nine, depending or more depending if it's a, a single barrel pick, and then of course uh, with this same recipe, they also have the twelve year, yeah. which is uh, obviously age stated. So, yeah. So basically, what the way that Buffalo Trace works, Jill, is they've got. Uh, predominantly they got three different mash bills. So like mash bill one, it's certain bottles. Like I think mash bill one's Buffalo trace, uh, Eagle rare. I can't remember their, can't remember the rest of them. Um, and then the mash bill two has Blanton's Hancock's reserve, uh, Elmer T Lee, Rock Hill, Farm. Rock Hill farms. Yeah. And then they have the third mash bill, which is the weeded mash bill. So they've got Weller special reserve, Weller one Oh seven, which is what he, antique one Oh seven. Well, or 12, uh, but then also the, the Van Winkle uh, bottles, the 10-year-old and the 12-year-old Lot B, and then the Pappy 15, 20, and 23 are all the same mash bill. So if this, we were talking, you were talking earlier, how do they know, you know, when to get it out of the barrel? You know, the, the Basil Hayden was 10 years. Um, so this Weller, if they leave this in the barrel, it'll become potentially Weller 12-year-old. And if they leave it in the barrel... A little bit longer, it could potentially become Pappy fifteen year old or Pappy twenty or Pappy twenty three. But it's basically this is the the mash bill that the Van Winkles and the and the Pappy is based on. So, so you're drinking extremely young Pappy here, maybe. You never, <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. Baby, baby Pappy, baby yep. baby Pappy. So, <laughs> all right. So on the nose, have you you had a chance to nose it yet, Jill? Have you? Yeah, it's this one's a little difficult. I I, I think vanilla. Okay. I smell vanilla, mm-hmm. but it's more almost like a v- vanilla bean. What's mm-hmm. inside of vanilla bean, and then like a like a. There's no wrong answer. Tiramisu, answers. like the cookies, like the lady fingers and tiramisu, uh, but it, okay. it, it marzipan. Because, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I smell marzipan. <laughs> She's ready to become a bourbon expert now. <laughs> oh, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. yeah. So I so that and then I mean it's it's almost a little. Um, it kind of reminds me of like. The smell kind of reminds me, like reminds me of rum for some reason, mm, like okay. something to do with rum, mm. and I don't know why. Interesting, Matt. What do you? Mm. I think the sweetness, you, maybe. What are you picking out of it? Uh, I always get a little bit of apple mm-hmm. from Special Reserve. Every time I I've, I've had it, I always can pick up just a little bit of apple, touch of butterscotch, maybe like a graham cracker, or like the crust of bread, like a just a like wheat wheat bread. You know, for some crust. reason. And and I'd say this on several different bourbons. Usually they're higher proof, but that sweetness for some reason reminds me of almost like a bubble gum. Mm-hmm. Um, the, going back to my childhood, yeah, and the, the, big league chew. the tops or the other yeah. big league chew or the tops baseball card packs, the bubble gum that comes out of the baseball card packs mm-hmm. when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sweetness, it's just so sweet. Um, it reminds me of that, that, that smell reminds me of mm-hmm. those, those baseball, the tops baseball cards and the pack of the, that stick of gum that would crumble in your hands. <laughs> covered in whatever cornstarch or whatever it was covered in that white powder. But, um, yeah. So, so you picked up quite a bit on this one, which is, that's good. I mean, but yeah, it's, it's di- obviously different than the other yeah. two. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's obviously much sweeter on the nose. You, you don't get that, that spiciness that you get from the rye at all. It's just a very sweet, a very sweet flavor to it. What about the, have you had a chance to taste no. it? No. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we don't want to rush here or anything, but you know, we do got to wrap. I'm just smelling lots of things here. Okay, We're going to have to wrap this up at some point, <laughs> you know, but that's all right. I think with the lack of age on this one, you get a little bit of burn, a little yeah. bit of alcohol on the taste and a little on the nose too. I yeah. catch like a touch of acetone, just a little bit of the alcohol, more alcohol burn that comes from a younger product. Yeah. Yeah, you look, are you getting a little uh, bit you of a burn? Like you're yeah, this is reminding me of my younger age drinking oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> like a yeah. alcohol burn. Yeah, so you're getting a, yeah, you're getting a little, and it's funny because you know <laughs> people go nuts over this, you know, because Weller in the bourbon community, I mean, there's a lot of people that go nuts over Weller. That's mm-hmm. what's so hard to find. But mm-hmm. in my opinion, I mean, Weller Special Reserve 
it's it's an easy drinker, but there's nothing that's remarkable to me about mm-hmm. it. I like the sweetness of it, but I mean, for me, I I use this a lot of times as a mixer. <laughs> it is. This is uh, this is a great mixer, and when you when you can be found at seventeen dollars, yeah, it's kind of hard to say no. I think. Sure. That being said, most of us have a one point seven five. Yeah, sitting at home, uh, yeah. a one point seven five liter, the big, the big boy sitting at home, because we just couldn't turn down the twenty nine dollar price tag. And, sure, and we'll get through it, but it takes, nobody's nobody's rushing to get through it. Yeah, what he's talking about, Jill. That most bottles are seven hundred fifty milliliters, mm-hmm. like a fifth, as mm-hmm. what you know we refer to it as. But a lot of the bottles come in a, a one point seven five liter, um, so we'll call it a handle which is it's a bigger bottle. So yeah, I've got like two handles of I mean, I'm familiar reserve. with big bottles of alcohol. Okay. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Am, am I am I man am I mansplaining again? I'm that, I mean, no, it's fine. <laughs> this whole episode is about how we can get women more involved and here I am mansplaining uh, like, No, you're but not. But I'm just saying for people that kidding. may not understand that, you know, bourbon bourbon's per, that we purchased it right. in 750s and 175s. Right. So just for people that aren't that since this is a bourbon basics kind of a show, you know, this episode is geared towards giving as much information. So I don't want to assume that anybody knows what a one seven five is, but, um, yeah, it's, it's an easy drinker, but it's, it's a good mixer and I'll put this in old fashions. Um, it, it's just something easy to mix with. I'm not crazy about it, but it's a lot of people are nuts about this bourbon. Um, but it, it is sweet. So I do like it. Uh, when it's, when I want something easy to drink, I'll drink this, but, but you picked out quite a bit. So anything else on the flavor that you're on the taste, yeah. the palate. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think everybody should have, should have a couple handles in their, you know, in their bar, you know, you <laughs> right. Go. You should have, <laughs> you know, for when you're entertaining, right. And mixing right. drinks. But, um, yeah, so it, you know, it does come on a little strong, but I, when I was saying that, then you're, you're talking about it and it finished really smooth. It just disappeared, you know, and yeah. finished smooth. So there was no burn after that. Good. So it's got a sh- kind of a short finish to it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and me, I mean, I, on the, on the finish almost, I pick up almost a little bit of like a brown sugary kind of, flavor to it i don't know it's just maybe that sweetness um but it, yeah i mean I, I like it but again it's not something that this is not going to be an everyday daily drinker for me something i'm going to sit back and be like oh yes but my second sip was better it well, wasn't as harsh you know good well and that you know that can happen once it hits get some air to it and mm-hmm. uh, you let it sit for a yeah. minute or two sometimes that'll happen it'll, mm-hmm. it'll you know it'll open up like a wine you mm-hmm. know it'll open up and and smooth out just a little bit and it'll be a little bit easier to drink so all right so in this third section that we're doing here i thought it might be good to do a little q a okay. you know we're not bourbon experts but uh, by any stretch of the imagination but we we are passionate about bourbon so we're just wondering as a newbie bourbon mm-hmm. drinker or someone that's learning more about bourbon are there any questions or anything anything you know that you you can think of that you have questions about Yes, I have I have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so is this a one hour or two hour podcast? Oh man, we're yeah. gonna be here all night. So uh, that's have, our listeners I'm, are wondering yeah. the same. I know they're thing. like, know. oh my god, how much longer is? This? <laughs> yeah, don't invite Jill again. Okay, so so we talked so bourbon versus whiskey, uh-huh. what, and and so most bourbon is in Kentucky, right? And so there's a reason. But what you know, it, I, I think in Kentucky we're kind of like. It's not bourbon unless it comes from Kentucky, and it's not basketball unless it comes from Kentucky <laughs> either, right? So what's so what's the difference? You know, well, for, so so good question. Every, what's bourbon? Every bourbon is whiskey, correct? But not every whiskey is a bourbon. So okay. bourbon is a specific category in the whiskey market. Uh, so you can have Scotch whiskey, you can have Canadian whiskey, you can have Irish whiskey, you can have blended whiskey, um, and bourbon is its own specific designation under federal law. And it has to meet certain requirements. It has to be, uh, it has to be at least fifty-one percent corn in the mash bill. It also has to be. It can't come off the still. I think at higher than one hundred and forty. One hundred sixty. One hundred and sixty proof. One hundred and sixty proof has it, to be distilled at less than one sixty. Okay, and it can't go into the barrel at more than one twenty-five, um, and it has to go into a new charred oak barrel. And it doesn't have to be white oak or Mer- it can be pretty much any type of oak, but it has to go into a brand new oak barrel. So you can't, they can't use a old barrel that they've already used uh, and call it bourbon. Now the crazy thing is, and a lot, a lot of people don't realize, well, number one, it doesn't have to be made in Kentucky. 
uh, as much as we would like to argue. <laughs> See, that's, uh, that's something I, I uh, so growing up and as I was getting more into bourbon, I was always told that it did have to be oh, produced sure. in Kentucky Every, for it to be bourbon because it had to, the water had to be draped across the limestone right, right, of right, Bardstown right. and sure. if it didn't, it didn't pick up that extra salinity. Yep. And so I was led astray to think that if it was bourbon, it had to be produced in Kentucky. Yeah, and that's as much as I would love to continue that that <clears throat> myth, it's not true. Uh, bourbon's produced everywhere, and uh, there's a lot of good pr- bourbon producers that are outside of Kentucky, but I think I want to say about 95% of the bourbon that's made uh, is actually produced here in Kentucky. So, I mean, we are obviously the number one producer of bourbon in the world, and I think I don't see that changing anytime soon even as the popularity of bourbon grows worldwide i I still think kentucky's going to continue to be the biggest producer of of bourbon but no it does not have to be you know produced in kentucky to be considered um to be considered bourbon so well i just can't believe they would have bourbon basketball and horses anywhere except for Kentucky. That's just what. <laughs> well, I don't, they don't have basketball anywhere, at least not in the state. They don't have anywhere other than Lexington, right? So, uh, but no. Ooh, no. <laughs> but that's no. But that's a good question. And again, like Matt said, I mean, a lot of people think that it has to be made from made in Kentucky, and mm-hmm. it, it 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 doesn't. So, um, but the other things, uh, another myth is that it has to be stored in a barrel for six months or a year or two years. It doesn't. You can actually put it in a barrel. It was it was I'm trying to think who it was that was talking about this. I think it was Denny Potter. We went to hear him speak earlier last year, and he was talking about uh, the 15, 15 rule or something like that. That they could you could basically just open a barrel and pour bourbon in and have a tap on the backside of it. And as long <laughs> as that bourbon actually ran into that barrel, that was a new charred oak barrel. And it ran out that tap. You could call it bourbon because it had been in a bourbon barrel that was newly charred. Or you could just put it in a barrel and roll it 15 feet and take it out. And it would be bourbon. Of course, it wouldn't taste very good. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. You want it to, <laughs> oh, you definitely, mercy. you definitely want your bourbon to age in a barrel. Um, but there is no, there is no time requirement for how long bourbon has to be in a barrel. So a lot of people think that it has to be a year or two years. Now there are certain qualifications to be considered, um, Straight bourbon, it has to be at least, I want to say at least a year it, to be Kentucky straight. Shit, I can't remember, but there are requirements. I think to be Kentucky straight, it has to be a minimum of two years. Uh, straight bourbon, I know, is a minimum of two. Two years, okay. Yeah, and if anything under four, you have to, have to age. label. It has to be an age statement on your label yeah. if you're under four years. Yeah, so you can learn a lot, obviously, by reading a label in, in uh, how old your bourbon is, hopefully. If it's not on there, then you know you got a bourbon that's generally going to be older than older than four years. So um, that's a good question. No. But but I mean, it, in Kentucky, we have the weather for it because we have really like hot. Sure. You know, hot, you know, and cold. And it's, I mean, and I had to Google this because I was like, because weather affects wine, you know, wherever it's grown. Yep. Right. You know, um, like a, you know, like... Um, just depending on where it's grown, it's going to taste very different. So for bourbon, you know, if it's very hot, it's like the, it's kind of like the liquid is coming in and out of the barrel, the sides of the barrel, and that is it's hot and cold and that kind of stuff. And Kentucky, we get all four seasons, sometimes within a week or a day. <laughs> but <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, like this last week is a perfect example, it, it, yeah, right? Yeah, I agree. Matt. So I mean, it's the right, it's those extremes that. Yeah, that's. Help. I think that that you're exactly right. That's why Kentucky does so well with. Uh, the bourbon is as our weather changes, the barrels and the wood and the staves are expanding and contracting. So that wood is sucking up or dispersing out the bourbon and giving it that characteristic and the flavor and the color and everything that you would get from the barrel. And I can remember going to do a tour at Michter's in Louisville and they had a cross section of a stave and you could see just how deep that bourbon had penetrated into the wood. There was a visible line that showed how far it had penetrated. And yeah. I think that's one of the reasons Kentucky does so well is we do have the climate changes that allow for the barrels to expand and contract and give so much character to the bourbon. And that's why, you know, you, they can't leave the bourbon in the barrels for extended, you know, beyond 23, 25 years um, because it's just going to be too much oak 
in it, but like with a scotch, um, where they don't have the variations of climate like we have here. I mean, you can have scotch that's been barreled for 60 years or McCowan just released the 72 or 70, yeah. 70 or 72 year, um, that they had the scotch that they had. So, I mean, it's been in a barrel for 60 years or more, um, which is kind of crazy to think that, mm -hmm. but you know, with the bourbon, you couldn't do it just because with the, cons just with the, with the way that the oak's going to interact with it, it's just going to taste most likely going to take taste awful. But now I know Buffalo trace has been doing some experimental stuff. They've built a new warehouse over there that's climate controlled. And my understanding is from what I've heard is that they're going to go and try to, to do a 40 year old bourbon in a climate controlled uh, Rick house. I'll have to check my stats on that, but that's what I've heard. Uh, wow. so that would be kind of interesting, but they can control the climate. So it's going to be, you know, most of these Rick houses have windows, they're exposed, the sun's coming in. And when we went to wilderness trail, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the barrels that were closer to the, closer to the window, I mean, a little hotter in proof because there was more evaporation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Macaulay said that those. affected those barrels more. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you get, you get the heat coming in, you get the sun coming in the windows. Um, you, you get the height of the rick house. So barrels on the top floor are going to get hotter because heat rises and the barrels on the lower floors, they're going to be able to stay and mature longer because you're not going to get the, the huge change. I mean, you you get the change in temperature, but not as much as a, a barrel sitting on the very top of a rick house. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting how everything plays together, but that's a good question. I think it's interesting because I was in, um, Monterey over the summer and, you know, like I said, I'd been to my sister with Napa before, but those two areas in California are very different for wine. And although they're pretty, the, 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 the climate's pretty calm all year round, like in Monterey, the difference is they have this 65 degree kind of just, it's like you're in your basement <laughs> constantly. Yeah. And then this fog that rolls over and like protects the grapes and it's, yeah. and so when I tried the wine there and the wine there is not expensive. And it's really good. And the the fog almost adds this different flavor. And their huh. their Pinot Noir there has been very successful, has been like a very successful wine and very good because they're able to keep it consistent because the grapes are very delicate for that, that particular kind of wine. Sure. So they're not drawing out and everything because they're, you know, where they have the wineries are very close to the coast and it's just temperature controlled, climate controlled, whatever. Yeah. So it's pretty cool what they're doing there with, with that. Um, Matt, but, I think she's trying to convince us to become red wine drinkers. Yeah, now. actually, actually, I, I came on here to convert you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I mean, I think it, I think that that's very welcome, interesting. Welcome to the red wine life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this has been an intervention. <laughs> yes, this was an intervention. I see your bourbon collection over there. <laughs> Oops. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that, so that's really interesting uh, that they would do that. And so I have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so what, what, what's your opinion on the mint and julep? So people think that that is what we drink in Kentucky when they watch the big horse race every year. So I can tell you that in my life, I have probably had two mint and juleps ever. I'm just not, I'm just not a big fan of mint and juleps at all. And I've never, never had, and I've, Believe it or not, I've never been to the Kentucky Derby. I just, it was something I never, uh, I, mean, I guess I wanted to go, but when I was in college, I was a bartender, so I was always working. Um, and then as an attorney, I just never took the time to to do it. You You've know, never like, been to the Derby? Never been to the Derby. I just, I never wanted to go to the infield after seeing videos and stuff. I just thought that just a, seems like it'd be a nightmare. Um, big crowds just kind of freak me out. Uh, <laughs> now, if I could go to Millionaire's Row, if somebody went... If anybody out there listening has access to Millionaire's <laughs> Row, please invite the Bourbon Life. I mean, seriously, I, I would love and to. me. Yeah, it, and we'll bring Jill. Uh, and and we'll, Red Wine Life. And yeah. Red, yeah, Red Wine Life and the Bourbon Life. But uh, if I could go you know, to someplace like that where there's not going to be as many people around um, and I'm not in the infield with 50,000 other people and it's raining and it's nasty and I, I would do it. But no, so mint juleps to me, I just, I'm not a big fan of them, never never really have been matt are you what do you, what's your thought my dog's name is julep oh <laughs> so you like mint juleps I, if, if that's any of a, a dead okay. giveaway i okay. love them all right well there you go uh, so next was, week's we're gonna have a new co-host i'm no, just kidding <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I do i live in my dog's shadow constantly that's all right man yeah. so so um what's your thought on them jill i mean well, you, well i never I, I mean, I've lived in Kentucky my whole life, and I'd never had one. And then I had, I was my my friend that lived in Louisville at the time. We, it was the week of the big race, and we were gonna find one. We were on Bardstown Road, and we had to go five places. And this one guy goes, I mean, I don't want to make one, but I will. But the best way to make one is to 
he said add whatever the ingredients are, throw it all out and keep the bourbon. Yeah, yeah, throw <laughs> the ingredients out. Yeah, throw them in the um, trash and drink the bourbon. I mean, I've I've been to the Derby a couple times and just I had some friends. She has extra ticket and she's she's let me go a couple times and um. I'll, at the Derby, I mean, they're pretty sweet because they pack them full of ice and they right. just, I think they have them in a big picture and they just pour them over everything, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think it's an experience, you know, yeah. but it's, I think if you're, I don't know. Okay. If, if someone gives me tickets to Millionaire's Row and I go to the Derby this year, then I will drink as many mint juleps as anybody <laughs> wants to, to give me. Now they do have those like thousand dollar, like you buy the, the, this year, I think it was a thousand dollars to buy this. Special yeah, mint yeah. julep. It was like oh, a fundraiser, yeah, but seen that, yeah. just craziness. But it has yeah. gold in it, Mark. Gold, the gold flakes. <laughs> it's got gold schlager in it. So <laughs> you get real flecks of gold, so you know it's yeah. good. But no, yeah. I'm, I'm not a mint julep guy. Matt obviously is. So mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah, we'll, it won't take millionaires row if anybody out there listening <laughs> wants to just come and drink mint juleps with me any day of the week. Okay, well, for the derby episode that we do, eventually we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make mint juleps, Matt, and I'll, uh, I promise I'll at least drink one with you but that's a good question i mean because people have preconceived notions you know they everybody in kentucky wants to drink a mint julep but i will tell you as far as i'm concerned mm, yeah no not gonna happen okay my last question is what right. what are your opinions on putting bourbon in the freezer because i know for some some alcohol i'll just tell you like for vodka for instance i know i also drink vodka so it's um you know, like if it's a cheaper vodka, it kind of hides some of those really like almost assaulting flavors or something. You sure. know, like if you're in college, maybe keep it. But if you have like a, a better vodka, you don't want to like freeze it and hide the nuances of the sure. f- layer of flavors, right? Matt, what so do you is think? it the same thing for bourbon? What's your thought on that? Uh, I had heard at one time, and I'm probably going to butcher this, so I apologize in advance. Uh, so much of what people want nowadays out of their bourbon is they want it to be non-chill filtered. Mm-hmm. We want to taste it as it comes from the barrel so that it hasn't been run through a lot of filtration. We want the little specks of barrel char in there, that extra bit of flavor. Um, someone had once told me if you take your bourbon and put it in the freezer you are essentially chilling it to that point that a lot of the oils from the charred staves and the charred barrel will sort of fall out of suspension in that liquid. So then at the bottom you get this settling of not sediment, sediment, excuse me, like you would see from a non-chill filtered bourbon, but you get like this, you get the oils that would come out of the the barrel and the char from freezing it. I could be completely wrong. Yeah, but I I thought I had heard that before. And I when I first started drinking bourbon on a regular basis, to be honest, um, I would drink Eagle Rare because that was my wife's favorite. So we would get Eagle Rare, and honestly, I would put it in the freezer, and I would just get it out, and I didn't drink it on the rocks. I didn't put any water in it, but I wanted it super super chilled. Um, and because it's non chill filtered, it would cloud, you know, so it wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't clear. Um, and that kind of freaks people out too. So if you, a non chill filtered bourbon, if you put ice in it, it'll chill it down and it will turn cloudy. Uh, and that people, a lot of times think, Oh my God, I got a bad bourbon because it's clouded up, you know, something's wrong with it, but it's not, it's because it's non chill filtered and it, it, it maintains those oils and things in the bourbon. And when you put ice in it or chill it or put it in the freezer, it will cloud up. So the Eagle Rare I used to drink was super cloudy. Of course, I didn't know back then why. I just, I still drink it. But I wanted it nice and cold. Uh, and I didn't want to put ice in it. So I used to drink it out of the freezer. Um, I haven't done that in years. So I really couldn't tell you in terms of a taste profile how it changes it. I'm sure it does. I mean, I'm sure there has to be some some change. It won't freeze because it's, you know, it's 90 proof, 45% alcohol. So mm-hmm. even the even the sediment or the, the non-alcohol particles aren't going to freeze. Um, but you know, to me, like I said earlier, there's no wrong way to drink bourbon. So if you enjoy putting your bourbon in the freezer and popping it out and having a drink of it, that's more power to you. So I don't have a problem with it. Is that good? All right. Any more questions, Jill? I think we're about at the end of the end of the show here. So no, I don't have any more questions. I've learned a lot tonight. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, I hope this has been helpful for other people as well. And um, like I said, we, we want to get 
more people involved in, in the bourbon community and we want more people to, to feel like bourbon is not something they have to be afraid to drink or it's not for them. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of options out there that people can enjoy, um, whether it's a 80 proofer to start with or, you know, even moving up to where I like to drink the 130 proofers. I mean, there's, there's a wide market out there for everybody. Um, and we'd love to have everybody along for the ride with us and live in, live in the, the bourbon life. Um, but before we close out, I do need to thank our sponsors again. And then also the stave restaurant located in beautiful, sunny Millville, Kentucky, one of our favorite places to go and have lunch or dinner. They've got a great uh, menu out there. And Jonathan Sanding, the chef is absolutely incredible with what he comes up with. So you guys need to check them out. All right. So Jill, you're a red wine drinker. So what do you think? You're going to become a bourbon drinker on the regular now or what? Yes. All right. We, <laughs> awesome. We but I need it. to, I don't own any bourbon. That's so okay. That. You're more than welcome to come and drink with us. And anybody out there in bourbon land <laughs> that wants to send Jill a bottle, you know, just let us know. We'd be happy to, yes, happy we, to send it to her maybe. Yeah. So I'm now asking for Kentucky Derby tickets and bottles of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt. So anything on your end, man, before we wrap this up here? Uh, Jill, thanks again for coming in. Yeah, and thanks. Taking your You're time welcome. to chat with us. And I'll take this time to give my shout out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We're still waiting for our care package to arrive. Uh, so if you're out there listening in Jackson Hole, let yeah. us know what's on the shelves because we know that you are sitting on it and we can't find it here in Kentucky. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. We really appreciate all your support. Um, the, the podcast has taken off uh, much more so than we even anticipated. So we feel very humbled by your support. And very fortunate to have you guys along uh, living the bourbon life with us. So until next week, again, we hope your glasses are always full and hope you guys just keep on living the bourbon life. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. Our mission at the Bourbon Life is simple, to share our passion for all things bourbon with you every week. And we'd really love to hear your thoughts on how we're doing. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Bourbon Life. You can also contact us by email at thebourbonlife at gmail.com. And you can always find us on your favorite podcast platform. If you have a moment, we'd love it if you would rate us and give us a review. So until next week, we hope your glass is always full and that you keep on living The Bourbon Life.